Rhode Island is the smallest state in the Union, but what it lacks in landmass, it more than makes up in creepy urban legends. Being a state with an extensive history, Little Rhodey seems to have a lot of bizarre and unexplainable occurrences that speak directly to the fears of many modern Americans. With one of the most haunted houses in the country, as well as the inspiration for Freddy Krueger. Join me today as we take a look at 10 of the many urban legends Rhode Island has to offer. The Biltmore Hotel opened its doors in 1922, and until the Industrial Tower was built six years later, it held the record as the second highest building in Providence. Today, it is still the ninth highest. The Biltmore Hotel has been the inspiration for films like Stephen King's The Shining's Overlook Hotel, as well as Robert Blotch's Bates Motel. But what many may not realize is that the Biltmore's past is much more sinister. Jordan Leslie Weisskopf, the original financer, was an open practicing Satanist who wanted to use the hotel to teach New England about the religion. He had chicken coops installed on the roof to supply weekly sacrifices, underground altars, and dug out springs for rituals and nude waitresses in the Banchette dining room. During Prohibition, it also served as a speakeasy. Many government officials and local police were known to frequent the hotel along with many organized crime members. Between 1922 and 1933, at least six officers were charged with a series of eight murders in the hotel. A governor, a mayor, and a cardinal were also involved in the drowning of an 11-year-old prostitute in the bathtub. Perhaps the most famous spirit of the Biltmore is of an unknown man who jumped from his 14th story room window after losing everything in the 1929 crash. It seems his spirit doesn't just haunt one room, but he has been reported to be seen wandering through all the rooms he had passed during his fall. Many guests have also reported seeing someone fall past their window, but when they went to check, there was never a body on the street below. Other ghosts reported are believed to be the spirits of those who were murdered at the hotel in the 1920s and 30s. Other reports from guests are the sounds of wild parties heard from empty rooms, and people have seen dancers in the ballroom when nobody was there. There have also been reports of people mysteriously vanishing from the hotel while they are staying. Did you know that New England has a long vampire history? And in fact, Rhode Island was considered the vampire capital of America. New England's vampire hysteria kicked off a century after the famous witch trials and Rhode Island took center stage. The vampire panic, which started in the 1790s, was built upon earlier outbreaks in Europe of people trying to find explanations for infectious diseases. In New England, the disease we know as tuberculosis was also known as consumption. The symptoms were a chronic, sometimes bloody cough, fever, and weight loss, which made it look as if loved ones were being consumed. By the turn of the 19th century, it was responsible for about one in every four deaths in the eastern U.S. Many people of that time believed that vampires, not disease, was responsible for the symptoms. 
and it had become common for many families to dig up and burn the dead relatives to try and stop the consumption from spreading. They believed that the best way to stop a vampire was burning its vital organs. The best documented case of supposed vampirism in Rhode Island is of Mercy Brown. In 1833, Mercy's mother died of consumption, followed by Mercy's 20-year-old sister seven months later. A couple of years passed, and then Mercy and her brother Edwin became sick. Edwin was sent away to recover, and Mercy died soon after. At this point, Mercy's father, George Brown, was desperate to save his remaining children. Although he did not believe in vampires, he consented to have each of his deceased family members exhumed. The Providence Journal reported on March 21, 1892, the medical examiner, Dr. Harold Metcalf, who also did not believe in vampirism, examined the bodies. When it came to Mercy's body, he removed the heart and liver. Blood still dripped from the organs. The attendants confirmed that this was a vampire and burned the heart and liver. As was also common practice at the time, the ashes were mixed with water and fed to Edwin to cure him. Edwin died two months later. Not long after his death, the vampire scare started winding down about the end of the 19th century, around the time Robert Koch identified the bacteria responsible for causing tuberculosis. Today, Mercy Brown's gravesite at Chestnut Hill Cemetery is a popular place for sightseers and curious visitors who often leave behind gifts on her grave. Since her death, there have been reports that Mercy haunts the cemetery as well as the surrounding grounds and roads. It is believed that she watches over and protects those buried here from having their graves violated like hers. Some say that if you stand directly on her grave, an unseen force will push you off. Other reports say that if you kneel by her grave and say a prayer, an overwhelming smell of roses will surround you. The Perron family, Roger, Caroline, and their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April, moved into the old Arnold estate of Harrisville, Rhode Island on December of 1970. The size of the house, coupled with the desire to live the quiet country life, motivated them to buy the home. The house, which was built in 1736, sat on 200 acres of land and seemed the perfect place to raise a family. The previous owners did give the Perrons what they thought was a strange piece of advice at the time. For the sake of your family, leave the lights on at night. It wasn't long, and the meaning of the ominous warning was understood. According to the parents, at first the spirits were friendly, especially towards the children. One entity they reported was Mrs. Arnold, the spirit that would tuck them in at night and even kiss their heads. The other was of a little boy named Johnny Arnold, that supposedly hung himself in the attic. He was said to have played with their toys and with the children. The Peron girls nicknamed him Manny. The other friendly spirits they reported were known simply as the Sweeping Ghost. This entity was usually only heard at a distance by the sound of a broom shuffling across the floor. Whenever the sound was checked out, they would find the broom leaning against the wall and a neat pile of dirt next to it. As the time went on, hauntings changed. The family reported that most mornings at 5.15 a.m., they would be awoken to their beds being lifted and the smell of rotting flesh throughout the house. Then the entity started pulling on the girl's hair and limbs at night. 
One night, the family reported that they heard a voice that said seven dead soldiers were buried within the walls of their home. These were not the only spirits to terrorize the Parons. There was also a spirit known as Bathsheba Sherman. According to Caroline, who said she researched the home's history, Bathsheba was born in 1812 and married Judson Sherman when she was in her 30s. Together, they are said to have had one son, but it is believed that the Shermans had three other children who died very young. During Bathsheba's lifetime, the parents said that she was involved with the death of one infant and accused of murder as well as being a sadist. It is claimed that the child's death was caused by an incision at the back of the head while in the care of Bathsheba. Soon, she was also rumored to be a witch who used the infant as a sacrifice to the devil. There was never a trial for the murder. When Bathsheba died, it is said that she turned to stone as part of Satan's price for having granted her such beauty. Bathsheba tormented the children by moving their toys and making things disappear, but to Caroline, she was said to be much worse. According to Caroline, Bathsheba had a strong hatred for her and was infatuated with Roger, her husband. Roger is said to have never experienced anything bad from Bathsheba, only light finger caresses and sensual advances. For Caroline, it was a different matter. She claimed that Bathsheba would make her things disappear, physically attack, and mentally torment her. Caroline said her energy felt constantly consumed, almost like Bathsheba was trying to possess her body. Finally, Ed and Lorraine Warren were called in for help. Lorraine quickly named Bathsheba as the evil entity and the Warrens declared the house to be diabolically infested. The Warrens and the Perons attempted a seance, which seemed to have backfired. The activity did increase. When the Perons were finally able to move from their house of horrors and Nancy Sutcliffe moved in. After years of living at the house, Nancy claims she has never seen or experienced any ghost or entities here. In 2019, Corey and Jennifer Heidson bought the house. Both are ghost hunters and feel the house is a piece of paranormal history. Since moving in, Corey has claimed to have experienced some standard paranormal activity such as disembodied voices and doors opening and closing on their own. He has also claimed to have seen a black mist he describes as looking like smoke that moves from place to place. According to historical records though, none of the people the Perons claim terrorized them have ever lived in the house or the property. There were never any mysterious deaths on the property either. So what caused all this torment? Was the actual haunting exaggerated? Or perhaps the house and the land were not what was haunted by the evil entities? Maybe it was the family themselves. Slater Mill was built in 1793 by an Englishman named Samuel Slater. Samuel immigrated to America when he was 25 years old and recreated the Arkwright system, which used water-powered mill to spin cotton yarn, turning Slater Mill into the country's first textile mill. President Andrew Jackson deemed him the father of American industry, but the English called him Slater the Traitor for bringing the English ingenuity to America. Slater Mill was known to employ entire families including young children around six or seven years old, which was not uncommon during the 1800s. Many of the smaller children were used to go inside the large machinery to fix problems. One machine on display today is known to have caused many dismemberments and deaths. Whenever the machine would jam, they would send in the small children to clear the jam because they believed they were 
smaller, they could escape quickly when it started working again. Unfortunately, that theory was wrong, and many children never returned alive. The spirits of the dead children are said to still haunt the mill today. Slater Mill is a working museum. When tours are given and the machines are turned on for demonstrations, the screams of the children can still be heard. Samuel Slater's spirit has been reported to be seen wandering the mill as well as by Blackstone River. Many people who have spotted the apparition have recognized him from old photos. The wheel pit is also said to have large amounts of electrical energy. Some have reported feeling uneasy when entering the wheel pit. Tingling sensations have been reported to be felt by those who enter the area and one young girl reported she was assaulted by an unseen being who left scratches on her face. Sprague Mansion, located in Cranston, Rhode Island, was built in 1790 and named after Governor William Sprague. The house was originally to be used as a farming house but through the years, it also served as a gist, cotton mill, and the Sprague Print Works in 1808. Four generations of the Sprague family owned the estate, including two governors who would later become U.S. Senators. The original building also constantly expanded until it was a sprawling 28-room estate with a ballroom, carriage house, and an expansive garden. The beautiful mansion also saw its share of tragedies during its time with the Sprague family. William Sprague died in 1836 from an infection caused from a chicken bone that was lodged in his throat. His son Amasa Sprague inherited the estate. He was a textile tycoon and considered one of the richest men in America at the time. To everyone's surprise, he was found dead on New Year's Day in 1843 on a street near the mansion. Amos's body had been severely beaten and also had a dog bite and a gunshot wound to his arm. At the time, an Irish immigrant named Nicholas Gordon was suspected because he did have motive against Amsama, who was recently revoked his liquor license because too many textile workers were constantly getting drunk at his pub. Although there was no evidence that Gordon was the killer, authorities pushed for a conviction. Gordon was found guilty and hung. It was later suspected that maybe the wrong man had hanged for the crime. Soon, speculation surrounded Amos' brother, William Sprague II. This was never pursued by authorities because of his untouchable social standing and wealth. William Sprague died from typhoid in 1850, never being charged with his brother's murder. More tragedy and suffering continued with Amos's son, William Sprague IV, who moved into the mansion with his wife, Kate Chase. Their son, William Willie Sprague V, committed suicide in 1890 in the mansion. Willie left behind a venomous note blaming his father. After her son's death, Kate, who was considered the ultimate trophy wife at the time, divorced her husband, becoming a recluse. Kate died in 1899, poor and alone, after squandering her fortune. Her ex-husband, William Sprague IV, died on September 11, 1915, from meningitis. William Sprague II's other son, Byron Sprague, took over the family business and the mill fell into hard times. During this time, Byron's daughter, 10-year-old Mary, suddenly died. It was starting to seem that the whole Sprague family was cursed. When the mansion was sold to Cranston Printing in the early 1900s, reports of the hauntings began. Residents and servants of the house would often report seeing a spectral figure on the main winding staircase 
who would later become known as Charlie the Butler. Other apparitions reported are of a woman in a fancy evening gown in the ballroom and an entity dwelling in the wine cellar that would brush against people. There are also reports of shadow figures seen in the many mirrors throughout the mansions. Other paranormal activity reported include objects moving on their own, random cold spots, bedding being pulled off of beds, usually while people are sleeping in them, phantom footsteps, and flickering lights. In 1968, after the mansion was sold to Cranston Historical Society, a seance was held there and it was said that Charlie Butler was contacted. He is said to have explained to them that he was upset because his daughter had never been able to marry one of the Sprague's and that he would only be at peace when somebody told his story. Charlie has gone on to become the most famous spirit of Sprague Mansion. Cranston Historical Society even holds an annual fundraising event called Annual Charlie Ghost Party. The Historical Society claims today that other hotspots are the Doll Room, which was a small room in a small house on the property that was full of creepy looking dolls. Sprague Mansion has become a prime destination for ghost hunters and has been featured on Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters. Dr. Joseph H. Ladd founded the Ladd School in 1908 as a school for the feeble-minded. It soon became home to many criminals and any person whose removal from population was deemed to benefit society. The school was also well known to use many immoral treatments, including forced sterilization. By 1950, the school's population reached 1,000, with many criminals housed here as well as the mentally disabled. Supervision became more difficult and the helpless suffered the most. In 1955, a 20-year-old inmate was charged with murder of a severely disabled nine-year-old boy. He suffocated him inside a laundry sack hanging from a shower head. Soon after, Dr. Ladd resigned and Dr. John G. Smith took control of the facility. Two years later, an investigation was launched due to the numerous allegations of abuse and neglect. The investigation proved the allegations to be true to a terrifying degree. Because of the overcrowding, it was found that the children slept head to foot, side by side on cots nine inches apart. Many of the children were regularly beaten, rooms didn't have toilets or sinks, Rats infested the entire facility, including the kitchen and dining areas, and the patients were given the wrong prescriptions and dosages. During the deinstitutionalized movement, Ladd School was closed in 1986, but it would take almost a decade later for the last of the patients to be relocated. Today, locals claim the abandoned school is haunted. Many visitors have reported hearing moaning, phantom footsteps, shuffling, and crying throughout the buildings. Many have also reported disembodied voices, mummering, and whispering. Doors opening and closing by themselves have been reported, and the same doors seem to lock at times, even with no locks seen on them. Growling sounds can also be heard in patients' rooms, where there are no animals present. Some visitors also claim to have been touched, shoved, or had items knocked from their hands from an unseen force. Outside, people are reported seeing human-shaped shadows moving across the field, disappearing into the woods. Disembodied voices are also reported outside, and some have reported that car radios go haywire or stop working and others have claimed their car alarms have gone off for no reason.
Belcourt Castle in Newport, Rhode Island is a large Louis VIII style estate that was built between 1891 and 1894. It also boasts a rich line of owners, starting with Oliver Belmont and his wife Alba Vanderbilt, followed by Elaine and Louis Lollerud, Donald and Harl Tenney, and the current owners Alex and Omni. The first owner, Oliver, had many interesting hobbies like collecting manuscripts from e evil times as well as collecting armor. In 1896, Oliver married Alva and in 1908 he passed away. Alva inherited the estate. Through her life, Alva made many health contributions to local hospitals, supported the arts, and created some organizations that would change the world forever. It was because of Alva women were given equal rights. Alva died when she was about 80 years old from injuries she received from a carriage accident. There have been many reports of paranormal activity through the years at Belcourt. One female tour guide that was leading a group through the ballroom reported hearing a male's voice repeatedly tell her to get out. After that summer season, she never returned. There is also a male figure that is reported to appear in full monk attire and wanders wherever his statue is located. It has since been moved to the chapel upon his request. The monk apparition has been seen in the chapel preparing for mass. The angry spirit of a knight relives his death at Belcourt Castle. His screams and shrieks are often reported to be heard. During tours, his helmet is reported to turn by itself, as if checking out the strangers in the room. Other reports include a lady in a ball gown on the second floor gallery and an older woman in pink clothing appearing in the Harl Tenney bedroom. Tower Hill Road is a narrow, twisting road with lots of hills and a deadly curve. Through the years, there have been many reports of strange happenings along this creepy road. Some of the most well-known hauntings are of a little ghost girl sitting in front of once would have been her home, a young boy running with his dog, and a toddler riding a tricycle. There is not much information on the little girl and boy, but there is a report of a toddler riding his tricycle being hit by a car. Today, there is a guardrail that stands where the accident happened. People have also reported that while traveling Tower Hill Road, it feels as if they're being watched. Others have reported seeing apparitions in the woods that they believe are those who died in accidents along the road. The strangest story from Tower Hill Road is of the Monkey Man that has been reported by investigators. Other reports come from the cemetery along the road where there have been reports of children laughing in the woods and when you return to your vehicle there will be children handprints all over it with no children around. In Rhode Island, there is a legend told around campfires of a man named Fingernail Freddy that many believe to be the inspiration for the Nightmare on Elm Street monster, Freddy Krueger. According to legends, a man named Freddy lived with his wife and daughters out in the woods in a small log cabin. They were always bothered by the local kids playing pranks, like letting the cows out or knocking over crops. Thinking to finally put a stop to it, Freddy loaded his shotgun with rock salt. The next time he caught the kids, he shot them with the salt to scare them off. Angry that the old man would dare do that, the kids went back for revenge. While Freddy was in the barn, they had set fire to the house with his wife and daughters trapped inside. When he saw the fire, Freddy ran into the house to save them, but he was too late. He was severely burnt and ended up disfigured from the injuries. 
Freddy eventually stopped going to town and became a hermit. One version says that Freddy got his revenge on the kids who burnt his house and murdered his family by killing each one. When he was finally taken into custody, his bloody fingernails had grown out and sharpened as murder weapons. When Freddy died, he was buried in the Elder Baloo Cemetery where his spirit is said to still wander, looking for other victims. Nathaniel Green Homestead, also known as Spell Hall, was built in 1770 by the Revolutionary War General Nathaniel Green. He sold the home to his brother Jacob in 1783 and it remained in the Green family until 1915. In 1919, the Green Homestead Association was formed to restore and care for the property. It became a National Historic Landmark in 1972 and is a museum today. As with many old structures, the Nathaniel Green Homestead has various reports of paranormal activity. Several volunteers have reported seeing the apparition of Elizabeth Margaret, the last Green family member to have lived at the residence. She appears in various locations throughout the house. The most often reported unexplainable occurrence is of a baby carriage in Elizabeth's room that moves from one side of the room to in front of the door all by itself. Other reports include door latches unlocking by themselves, disembodied voices, phantom footsteps, and the smell of fresh baked bread coming from the kitchen, which is now inoperable. There have also been reports of the sound of a horse carriage approaching the house, going past it and then fading to silence behind the house, but no carriages have ever been seen. <laughs>